Hello, everyone, and welcome on the Graduate Academy debate on Unheard Voices, Women and Children and the German and Soviet Occupation in Poland. Uh, there was a small change, and I apologize for the change. Instead of Alina Nowybilska, today's debate will moderate Lydia Roberts, who is our Graduate Academy student and a PhD student in the Department of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Languages and Cultures at the University of California. We will wait just for another minute, and then we can start. Lydia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Um, right, so we're going to wait just a couple of minutes, but um, as we um, get started, I'd like to um, introduce our speakers. Um, sorry. Um, So, um, Professor Johannes Dieter Stein, Steiner uh, at University of Wolverhampton, Wolverhampton is a professor of modern European history and migration studies. Um, and he is a senior fellow at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies and um, has been awarded the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for Holocaust Research in 2020. Um, and his research interest, interests include international migration and minorities, forced migration, survivors of Nazi persecution, um, international human humanitarian assistance and child forced labor. And the, these are some of the topics we'll be discussing today. Um, we're also uh, pleased to have um, Teresa von Torchichi here. Uh, she's a historian who works in the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum in the Schwechen. Her research focuses on the faith of various prisoner groups, including religious prisoners. Um, and she also researches medical atrocities that were carried out, carried out at the camp. Um, so she's a, currently a, a, a guide at the museum as well and leads tour groups there. Um, so uh, Olga, are we good to, to get started with the debate or with the conversation? Yes, I think so. Okay, fantastic. So um, we're gonna talk about uh, women and children and we're also gonna talk about these two major overlapping topics which are concentration camps and forced labor. Um, and we're gonna sort of Throughout, I'll try to bring in my experience as, as a sort of Sovietologist working on the Soviet um, forced labor system and camp system. Um, but what we're going to start with is looking at the experiences of women and then talking about children as well, uh, which is a lot of ground to cover. So what I'd like to do is start with Teresa, if um, you could tell us a little bit more about women in the concentration camps. When do we start? To, when do we first see them in the concentration camps and what are their experiences? Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, being part of this uh, uh, conversation. And thank, thank you also for um, suggesting that that's something we should talk about, that's something we should approach and analyze uh, a little bit closer and maybe from very different perspectives. That's, that's all, always what, what was bringing loads of uh, great um, uh, profits. And uh, if we think of Auschwitz, actually, the first prisoners we think of are, are men, because this is how the camp was established. This is how uh, the camp was organized. And looking at the different various groups deported here, we may also see clearly the situation in occupied Poland as we are going to approach also the, uh, the situation on the parts which were under Soviet control. We have to remember that Poland in 1939 uh, was divided between those two countries. And within the part which was uh, under the German control, again, the Western, Southwest, more or less, uh, was having uh, another uh, uh, another political state, was became part of Germany. And then the central part, let's call it like this, together with uh, Krakow as the capital and Warsaw, was uh, the part which was under German uh, occupation. And, and the town, uh, the name was Oświęcim, later on changed 
uh, into German Auschwitz because uh, the territory was incorporated into uh, Nazi Germany. Together with the uh, new uh, political situation, the uh, different ways of mass arrest in Polish society were introduced. First, they were targeting Polish uh, leaders, Polish leading groups, intellectuals, people known, people respected in the society, those who could organize the resistance movement. So we may see the um, Fandungsbuchs, which were especially uh, prepared lists of the Polish uh, activists, and the uh, prisons overcrowded and people gradually being deported from the prisons to concentration camps in Germany. So Sachsenhausen mainly, also Dachau, in some way also uh, Buchenwald. Later on, because of this uh, uh, overcrowd, because of the, of the tense situation, uh, Auschwitz as a camp was uh, established. Uh, and the first year, uh, this is the extension of the camp. This is organization, this is building, this is construction. And we may see the different transports being deported here from all, uh, uh, all regions of Poland. So not only the territory occupied, uh, uh, occupied by the Germans, but also from the parts which were uh, part of Germany. So from Silesia region from, from uh, Poznan region and uh, many others. And the arrests in Polish society, they are not only men, also women. And the women, Polish women were being deported to, uh, to Germany, to Ravensburg, which was the, the eventually biggest uh, concentration camp for, for women. And uh, in 1942, as there were another waves of arrests uh, in Polish society, and the prisons are again overcrowded. So this is a, this is why um, the decision is to make like a uh, like a branch, like a subcamp of Ravensbrück here in Auschwitz, and this is how the camp started to uh, organize here. So let me share with you some slides of what it looked like. So the very beginning, sorry, I have to, the very beginning of the camp existence, uh, this is the 14th of June, uh, 1940 and March, uh, 26th of March, 1942. So, Two years later, we may see in the camp the first group of women. The, in the morning, 999 women from uh, Ravensbrück. Uh, they were different categories. They were some of them antisocial prisoners, but also political prisoners, like we may see here, the nun Maria Cecilia Auch, the Catholic nun. We may also see in this group the prisoners which were marked with the abbreviation IBB, Internationale Bibelforscher Vereinigung. But generally, the, all this group was to organize the camp, to uh, build the structure, to, um, as they knew that they were in Ravensbrück for several years and they knew how the camp uh, was organized. So they were responsible for all the uh, duties. And then in the following transports, more women were being sent. Girls like Zofia Posmysz, I've got the, this honor to know her, to uh, listen many times uh, her to speak. Uh, a girl tied with a resistance movement. Very simple, just the first organizations captured um, as the whole group actually was uh, was arrested. And then the work starts in uh, uh, also for the women, uh, work mainly outside the camp, as the camp in Birkenau is being under construction. So a few months after the female sector in Auschwitz is uh, being, uh, is closed and all the women are being moved to Birkenau. And this is actually where the 
Frauen äh, Lager, so the Frauen, äh, the, the camp for women was äh, organized. Äh, and äh, many more groups of women are being deported from some specific regions of Poland, like here we may see a picture from Zamość region where the whole families, men and mainly women and children were deported. Actually, that was the first time in the camp that larger groups of children also were being uh, deported here. Here we may see the family tragedies like mother and daughter, uh, Katarzyna Kwoka and Czesława Kwoka. And they were brought for the camp, they were registered, and uh, the sanitary situation in the camp was catastrophal. So they actually both died in the camp after a short period of time. Uh, Czesława, daughter, she was only uh, 14 years old. Then another really huge group of Poles was brought here from Warsaw in uh, uh, August 1944 when the uprising started in the in the city, civilians, mainly mothers and children. Uh, uh, they were gathered in Pruszków and then with the whole groups, they were deported to uh, Auschwitz camp. And that was another occasion that really large groups of, um, of women together with children were uh, located. But also the transports uh, of women were sent from all occupied uh, uh, Europe. And for example, from France, Charlotte Delbo, uh, the uh, active member of political uh, parties, communist party, uh, exactly, uh, arrested together with the other members. Or, or just ordinary people from Eastern Europe, like Anna Polszczykowa from uh, from Russia or from uh, for from Croatia, the family of uh, Mandic. Uh, here we may see the free uh, free people from this family: the mother, her son, and the grandmother. The other, uh, they were also from uh, another parts like Jane Henning. Jane Henning was actually Scottish and she was arrested in Budapest. She was the mother of the boarding school in, uh, in the city and arrested because of helping, providing help for people who were in uh, needy. Then another really large groups of women who deported here were the Sinti and Roma. Special group marked with a special category, just like we may see here on the uh, on the uh, tattoo, Z, which stands for Zigoiner, Gypsy, and they were registered in the camp. And the sanitary situation in the camp was catastrophe. So the mortality rate in this uh, in this camp was was so high as never uh, before in the camp. And 1942, the beginning of women in the camp, this is also the beginning of so-called final solution, the endlessung. In uh, January 1942, the, the final solution was discussed, was debated in, in Wannsee. Uh, so the transport started to be sent also to uh, the camp in Auschwitz. And the very famous photographs taken uh, in Birkenau, um, actually a little bit later in 1944, where we may see the whole Jewish families, mother, mothers with children, convinced in many ways that they are going to be relocated. And after selection, vast majority of them was sent straight for the gas chambers, which were specially designed, specially built in Beer Canal for the extermination, immediate extermination of the Jewish people. Here we may see a group of them, children and mothers. And as we know from the analysis, they are actually on the way for the, for the gas chambers. So, uh, some part of the uh, women the brought in this in this transports they were registered in the camp for example from from uh, in one of the transport from holland was alma rosa a famous musician and she was taken for the camp and in auschwitz she was the conductor of 
um, the female orchestra. The women registered in the camp, Jewish women registered in the camp, again, they were given a category, separate category for them, you the, what, what means uh, Jewish. And they were sent for work, work mainly uh, by building construction, badly organized, uh, always in a hurry. Some of them were also working in the camp while sorting, uh, searching the personal efforts or a work by farms when they were to prepare the pounds or the fields for, um, for, for the feather uh, work. Women were also subjected, subjected for medical crime, for medical experiments. And one of the German scientists, criminalists, uh, in fact, Professor Karl Klauberg was sent for Auschwitz specifically to find the most, the cheapest and the most successful method of mass sterilization. And women, mainly Jewish women, were selected on the unloading platform and they were given for his uh, disposal. Another physician who also was using women for experimentation was Dr. Horst Schumann. Uh, and he was using in his um, in his uh, project X-rays. Then uh, some group of women, here we may see the family of dwarves, brought Jewish family from Hungary. They were uh, separated, they were taken by Josef Mengele uh, as his interests uh, were. He, he got many different projects and one of them was also the, the, the secret of twins. Well, so far I introduced uh, the um, victims, but we also have to remember that the women in Auschwitz, small group, but quite significant and remembered by many are the women perpetrators, the women the supervisors, the German uh, Aufseherinnen. So the women who choose to be in the camp, to work in the camp, as those who are watching the other uh, female prisoners. On this very precious photographs taken in June 1944, we may see some of the women, uh, they were mainly working in, working in the offices. They were also nurses, nurses of German Red Cross who were in the hospital for German soldiers. And again, they were volunteers, they were not forced. They chose to be sent for this place as, uh, as nurses. They, they, the work was not to deal much with prisoners, mainly with the SS soldiers. The perpetrators we may see also on this very um, precious photographs taken from the, from the trial. So the trial, which was after the uh, war. So this is more or less uh, about the, the women and uh, do I have also the time to approach the children? Um, yes, you might as well talk a bit about that and we can go back to it later too. Okay, so children. The camp was not for children. The camp was for adults. That was the idea. They committed the adults because of the decision of uh, Gestapo or the German court. Uh, so there was always some legal uh, issue which was to decide that um, the, the person uh, is to be sent, uh, is sentenced and was eventually sent for concentration camp. But somehow, even in the first transports, there were children brought to Auschwitz, well, teenagers. We have to uh, consider first the children as the people up till uh, 14 years old, and then uh, the, the uh, prisoners between 15 and 18 as a, as a youth. So the historians are saying that over 232,000 uh, 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 young people uh, up to the age of 18 were sent for this for this camp. The larger groups group are uh, Jewish children. And here we may see them among the, those who were registered in the camp. They were, again, 
some of them marked with the separate letter J, which stands for Juden, Jewish. And then they were categorized as uh, political prisoners from Poland. Here we may see two Jewish boys from uh, Poland. Not only from Poland, here we may see a boy from Italy, um, Luigi Ferri, and also the number, the camp number tattooed on his uh, arm. Among those who were brought in the mass transports, a vast majority was sent for, uh, for destruction for the uh, gas chambers. I already uh, showed a few of these photographs from the unloading platform uh, in Birkenau from May 1944. So here we may see again the mothers and the children on the way for the gas chambers from all occupied Europe. So the, uh, from France, from the Netherlands, from Austria, also from Lithuania. Sinti and Roma children, again, they were deported within the same structure. The uh, Sinti and Roma were treated as another group which is not fitting to the uh, to the model of the of the society in Germany. So this is why uh, the whole families were brought here, men, women, and children, and they were not selected. They were all sent immediately for the camp. As uh, as I uh, showed before, they were given the separate number. They were also photographed. Uh, and, and again, from Germany and many other uh, countries of occupied uh, Europe. Polish children, they were sent here uh, because some of them were having some contacts with the resistance movement. Just like here we may see Janusz Pogonowski, young man, young student from uh, Krakow, uh, who, who was a member of the resistance movement. And this is why he was arrested and brought here and died. He was hung here in uh, Auschwitz as the revenge of some other prisoner escaping. Then we may see the 16, uh, the, the boy uh, age 16 from Krakow, Josef Kocik, who again uh, is having um, a photograph and also the death certificate, the official camp documentation. And look here at the top, we may read that he was a Schiller. So it means he was a student. He was a, a, a schoolboy uh, sent to the camp with another group of inmates. Then the, the larger group of uh, children was uh, deported here at the time of the uprising in, in Warsaw, as uh, I mentioned before, the women. So here we may see some of the, uh, of the children. And something very precious, precious from our collection department, this is a dress. This is a dress which was made by mother and the material she was using was the blanket, the camp blanket. The daughter we may see here, Maria Malinkowska, was brought for the camp with her summer dress uh, as that was August 44. And the weather has changed quickly so the mother was using the hair clip and the blanket to make this dress for the, for the girl. Of course, it was very risky because the blanket was the property of the camp. So she was not too ruined. Uh, she, could be, uh, she could be really punished for, for this, uh, but somehow it was not found. And this very precious dress we are having in our collection department. There is also a number of children born in the camp. That's something very special to the scans. And there were women brought here at the different stages of pregnancy uh, in the first transports from prisons, uh, among the uh, Roma women, among the Jewish women, and also the, the Polish women from Warsaw Uprising. Uh, most of the children who were born in the camp, they, they died, died because of the conditions, because of starvation. Some those who were brought, uh, born closer to the camp liberation, like 
like Anna Bogdańska, uh, managed to survive. And notice, please, just this very special camp uh, certificate, the board Ort Kunde, so the birth, uh, the birth certificate, and it's written here that she was born in Auschwitz. Of course, there is no information about concentration camp. It's Kasernenstrasse. This is the street where the camp is being located. But he was born in the uh, camp. Then the, uh, then the children from the other parts of occupied uh, Europe, like a boy from Czech, Miroslav Kubik. Uh, children from Slovenia sent here as the revenge of the resistance uh, movement. Ukrainian children arrested that as some of them, of them wanted to avoid being sent for the slave labor. They were captured and they were sent for concentration camp. Here is another group of children from Białoruś uh, also sent to Auschwitz. This picture was taken after the liberation in the, in the orphanage was where they were uh, placed eventually. And uh, children were also taken, oh, sorry, just for the, for the medical experiments, for this crime. Uh, the photograph, which is known uh, from many publication, a um, group of uh, uh, Sinti uh, girls, which were most probably taken for experimentation by Dr. Josef Mengele. It was, uh, he was, as I said before, focusing on many subjects. Uh, I showed the family of dwarves, which was deported here, and again was taken for his disposal. But his major top uh, uh, programs were considering uh, genetics, so this is why twins and triplets were uh, selected from, um, from the arriving uh, prisoners. Very, uh, very special group of children, 20 children, Jewish, 10 boys and 10 girls were selected for the disposal of Dr. Um, Kurt Heismeyer, who was um, experimenting on tuberculosis. They were uh, first injected with some of the bacteria, and then they were sent for um, uh, Neuengamme. And in Neuengamme, uh, on the 21st of April, so there was the anniversary a few days ago, uh, all the boys and girls, they were hung, they were murdered uh, as the British army was approaching. So the idea was to eliminate the evidence of crime. So maybe I will stop here in this moment. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, maybe we can turn to Dieter for, for a, a bit. Um, I wanted to start by asking, essentially, Teresa pointed out that her framework for evaluating what a child is in terms of her scholarship um, is that up to 15 as a child, 15 to 18 as a youth. Do you use the same heuristic when you're evaluating children's experiences in the camps? Or do you have a different definition of child? You're muted. Unmute. Uh, um, well, it, it, it's similar, but, but not quite the same. So in, in my own research on, on child forced laborers, I use the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child from 1989, defining, quote, a child means every human being below the age of 18 years. That's what Teresa has summarized as children and, and youth juveniles. Uh, of course, if you, and, and that makes it similar, if you uh, use such a broad definition, uh, then you have to uh, build cohorts because the, the experience of a, let's say, a, a nine-year-old boy is very different from the experience of a 17-year-old uh, girl or young woman, we would say correctly, uh, today. Um, so the, the broad definition of a child being somebody uh, below the age of 18 allows and, and demands to, to build cohorts. And in, in that respect, it, it, it's very similar uh, to, to what uh, Teresa has introduced us to. Um, the, 
Well, we, we have to say that the Germans at that time who built up the camps in, in the occupied Poland and elsewhere, they were not interested in the category child as forced laborers. Uh, children under the age, Jewish children under the age of 14 uh, arriving in Auschwitz uh, were more or less sent directly to the gas chambers. And those children who were selected as forced laborers at the ramp in Auschwitz and uh, were then transferred be to the women's part of the camp or to, to the men's part of the camp. They, they were treated like all other uh, prisoners there, uh, treated in terms of, of, of food, of uh, non-existing uh, medical treatment, of work, etc. So they, there is no in the German um, terminology, so to say, they, they, there is no uh, group children in Auschwitz. Occasionally, the Germans wanted to collect the children uh, in, in so-called uh, Kinder uh, Blöcke, children's blocks, uh, to, to uh, just to get an overview how many children, younger children, were they in the camp, and not at least to, to make it easier for them to send them to the gas chambers. Maybe so far. That doesn't necessarily mean that children didn't perceive themselves as children. So maybe in the sources that you're looking at, how do they express, I guess, the experience of being a child? Yes. No, no, that, that, that's right. And, and that's uh, what I'm particularly interested in because my uh, research first on, on Polish and Soviet children, and then a second book on, uh, on Jewish children, and hopefully in a few years time, a book on Sinti and Roma child forced labor. These books are, are based on testimonies, on accounts. And, and uh, very, for me, very important question is how do former child forced labor remember that time as a child forced labor? How do they perceive themselves? And that is a bit unconventional, still unconventional work for a historian, mainstream historians are interested in documents, uh, while on the basis of documents, you cannot research the fate of child forced laborers. You have to have accounts, you have to have testimonies, you have to have the narration and the perception and how children later on, occasionally 50, 60 years later, remember that time, how they try to make sense of what happened to them and, and what their focus is. And uh, it is absolutely safe to say that uh, Polish child forced laborers, when they talk about their experience, they have a different focus. They talk mainly about their work, while Jewish children um, talk mainly about the vicinity of death and the family. And occasionally they mention forced labor as a tool to survive. And that makes it, for a historian, um, with all respect, it, ma it makes it very, very interesting to analyze these testimonies. And if you go to the testimonies and accounts of, of Sinti and Roma, it, it's, it's different again. Very interesting. Maybe you could give us sort of a, a more of a broad overview of what kind of labor is happening. Uh, Teresa introduced us to the, the labor that women would have been doing at the camps, but I understand that um, as the war progressed, as the war economy progressed, labor started to move and people were transported. So maybe you could just introduce us to that movement as well, people. Yeah, if you start with, with work in, in the camps, uh, I've found some example described in my book on, on Polish and Soviet children. Uh, Teresa ha has mainly uh, said it all already, uh, work, was, was not different for children. 
because they were not treated and regarded as children. Once you were in the camp, you, you uh, had to do all the work adults had to do. Sometimes children got better, in inverted commas, better positions with the help of well-meaning, but often not so well-meaning adults who wanted to abuse the children and therefore uh, got them uh, uh, so-called better jobs in the kitchen within the camp. But again, that was perceived very differently. While some children regarded a job, a work within the camp as a better job because you were protected from the weather, from the frost, from the rain, and you had the chance to maybe to, to acquire a bit more food or to see a relative in another part of the camp. So some children, former child forced laborers, regard work, regarded work in the camp as a better job. Others said, no, 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 you had to leave the camp because it was far too dangerous to stay in the camp, in the camps like, like, uh, like Auschwitz. It's better to endure the, the long walk to the outside workplace. It's better, it was better to endure the beatings uh, than to stay in the camp where guards were everywhere and, and you, the danger was far too great uh, to uh, be sent, uh, sent to, you, to, to your death. So I have one, one example, it's, it's Bartosz uh, from, he was born in, in Warsaw, he was a political prisoner and he arrived in Auschwitz at the age of 16, uh, so qualifies, uh, so to say, in, into my category of a child for Teresa, it would be a juvenile. So he arrived uh, in August 1940. He, he was very uh, among the very first Polish political prisoners. And he, he was, of course, not the first child sent as a political prisoner uh, to a concentration, a concentration camp. Because, as we know, the first concentration camps were built up in Germany in 1933. And, and there were children as political prisoners sent to these camps as well. But in occupied Poland, Bartosz was certainly among the first when he arrived in Auschwitz in August 1940, and he remained there until February 1942. Unlike other prisoners, Bartosz had not to work hard physically. Uh, at first, he was employed as a so-called gatekeeper in block 28, the sick block. Gatekeeper means you, you have to open and close the, uh, the gate for incoming functionaries, for SS, for guards, etc. Maybe, maybe you were employed as a runner as well, you have to distribute messages in, in the camp. So that was a work or a job many children regarded as a good job, being in the camp. But then he was transferred already in October or November 1941 uh, to the so-called Dirty Operating Theater, where the operation took place in Block 28. First, he had to arrange medicines, hand out instruments during surgeries, uh, change uh, bandages or wound dressing, uh, had to clean the rooms, which again was a good job. Uh, and he described it as a good job, not at least because it was warm inside the block. However, prisoners were also murdered in this block with injections. At first, he described his experience, uh, he had to leave the room when murdering took place. They sent him out uh, during uh, the crimes took place. Later on, he was required uh, to have the phenol uh, bottle ready and to get the injections ready for use. So he, he was in some way forced to participate in the crimes. And, and that is a very, very uh, typical uh, because in, in many, many of the camps, adults like children 
worked in the vicinity of mass murder of the Shoah. And not, not only in Auschwitz, we have that in, in, in Belgets or in Sobibor and other camps where children belong to the so-called working groups, we had to sort the belongings, we had to clean the gas chambers. Some children described that they had to, in the so-called tube, the way that led, the camouflaged way that led uh, from, from the uh, undressing area to the gas chamber, they had to cut the women's hair and they uh, reported it. About it. So what Bartosz did was not uncommon. And as I said, he left Auschwitz, went on a so-called transport, uh, a word which I hate very much, in February 1942, transferred to another concentration camp. And that again is, is very, very typical, and, and Teresa has talked briefly about it. Uh, the purpose of a camp like Auschwitz was not only to murder people in the gas chambers or to execute political prisoners or to imprison uh, members of the Polish resistance. Auschwitz and in particular uh, Birkenau was a transit camp. Once you have had survived the ramp and the selection of the ramp and made your way uh, to the Birkenau camps, to the men's camp or the women's camp, it you could die there, there were selections, but the purpose of a transit camp was to transfer you to a workplace, to another camp, to one of the sub camps, uh, to one of the hundreds and thousands of, ca of camps in the occ German occupied areas, but also in Germany. And there was hardly in 1944, uh, early 1945, was hardly a German firm or a German town a German city that had not a subcamp of one of the larger concentration camps. So Auschwitz and in particular Birkenau, they served primarily as transit camps. Uh, some historians called it the gateway to the German forced labor uh, uh, system. And that was, as I said, very, very, very typical. Other typical work for children, and that brings us already at the end of the existence of Auschwitz, um, when there were greater chances to, to survive uh, Auschwitz and other concentration camp, uh, children of former child for, uh, laborers often talked about pulling the trolleys and the carts within the camp. Uh, they transported coal, floorboards, machines. Uh, uh, children helped to dismantle the barracks, the gas chambers, took the, the tiles off the roofs and, and sent them uh, to Germany. And among those was, was Bogdan. He was deported just after the Warsaw Uprising. And he described his experience in his memoirs entitled A Childhood Behind Barbed Wire, published in, in 2008. And he described in great detail that he was uh, harnessed to such a cart with 20 other boys, uh, all of them between 10 and, and 14 years. And I quote uh, from his book, there are wire handles on it all around, one for each of them. We carry all kinds of things on the cart, pots, bundles of rags, boots, stools, blankets. And once the day after a long roll call in the rain and cold, when the corpse squad couldn't keep up, we even carried corpses. From seven in the morning until four in the afternoon, we drove up and down the road between the men's camp and already abandoned women's camp four or five times. Only Russian prisoners of war work there. They dismantled the blocks, load trophies onto our wagons to be sent to Germany. So that, that two, two stories, one from, from Bartosz and, and his experience, and uh, one from, from Bogdan from, uh, who arrived in Auschwitz after um, the Warsaw uprising. 
deportation from Auschwitz to other camps uh, already started in April 1941, when I found a story about 1,000 prisoners from Auschwitz who arrived in, in Neuengamme concentration camp. And there were, the document is not very precise, it says there were youth among them uh, who then worked building canals in digging trenches and in Neuengamme doing earthwork and, and transport. In some of the concentration camps, there were children's columns or children groups uh, who were then uh, deployed to work for hard physical work. Others work in, in brick uh, factories to produce bricks or a lot of children also found themselves in ammunition factories producing aircraft parts underground in salt mines, or they worked in Auschwitz in, in one of the ammunition factories. Maybe I'll stop here. Sure, it sort of leaves an interesting place for, um, Teresa, you had mentioned a story you had from your own family that sort of relates to these factories. Maybe you could um, tell us a bit more about your, your aunt and we could talk a little bit more about women's experiences following that. Thank you very much, Dieter, for mentioning the uh, for mentioning the testimonies. They are so so precious and important. Well, when I came to work, uh, I got just this unbelievable and so uh, unique opportunity to to interview still many of the survivors coming and many of them as, uh, as children. I remember uh, Eva Moses Kaur. I remember many of the uh, survivors from Warsaw Uprising. And I also remember the Roma survivors and they were, they were, they were so few of them, they were so, uh, because not many survived, actually. That's the, the, the tragedy of the, um, of the Roma uh, people. But thank you, Lydia, for uh, my family uh, story. So what you may see on the screen, this is my family. Uh, my dad is uh, my, my grandparents, grandmother, grandfather, their children, and my dad is uh, just on his father's uh, laps. This photograph was taken in Germany in 1947 after the war, as the whole family was in camp, in a work camp. That was in Weiden, uh, not far away from Nuremberg. The, my family was living in, uh, in Eastern Poland, uh, which was first attacked by the uh, Red Army, and then in 1940, one after the German forces invaded the Soviet Union, the German occupation started. And uh, in 1943, the eldest sister, we may see, here, see her on, on the right-hand side, my aunt Mary, she was 15 and she was called by the office to be sent for, for work in Germany. My grandparents were terrified but there were some other, some neighbors who were also sent for work. So she was with this group of, of the people from, from the neighborhood. And she was sent for Augsburg for the factory, uh, which uh, was Messerschmitt uh, factory. So they were um, producing aeroplanes. And most of the workers there were the uh, French prisoners of war. And my aunt, as a, as a 15 years old girl, was, was working in the kitchen, a kitchen for, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the prisoners who worked there. And then in 1944, when the uh, German forces were retreating because of the, of the progress of the Red Army, the whole family, all of them, were sent for Germany for slave labor. My grandparents were sent for railway factory and the children, the boys and my other aunt, 
they were sent, the aunt was sent for factory and the boys were sent for, uh, for the farmers to do some, some, some work, simple work as for the child in the, in the farm. My youngest, the, the, the youngest daughter, she was a baby. So she was staying in the camp and, uh, and my, fa my father was watching there occasionally in shifts, uh, the grandmother and, and the other daughter. So when they were uh, in, uh, in Weiden, my grandmother was using all the possible uh, offices, knocking all the possible doors to get the eldest daughter uh, to be reunited because she was under age, she was, she was 16. So according to the, to the law, she was not to be alone there. And she succeeded in winter 1914-45, my aunt uh, was sent from Augsburg to Weiden and she stayed until May, so the five next months in the camp together with the, with the family uh, members. Well, all the stories about uh, the family being in the camp, I heard all my childhood. And some years ago, I decided to write, to, to interview my aunts, to interview my uh, uncles. And as Dieter was saying about the different perce perception of the, uh, of the children being sent for, for slave labor, when I read closely my aunt uh, testimonies, she is first of all stretching the um, underlying the, the fact that she was she was very lonely and she was really scared. She was brave. She was brave enough. She remembered some addresses of the relatives, so she was writing to to some distant family members just to get in contact, just to get in touch. And, uh, but she, she, was, uh, she was alone with, all the, with many people she didn't know. So the loneliness and the fear. And uh, as Dieter was uh, mentioning the work, which was the chance for better life, the same was for her. She was 15, so she, first she was sent in the kitchen for some cleaning. And then she noticed that, well, being uh, uh, closer to the cooks can bring her more uh, uh, better place, better shifts, better treatment, better company to work around, maybe some Polish girls so she can, she can talk, she can, she can have company. So again, the work was, just the force to survive. And then that, that was, as they are all saying, that was, that was great luck that they managed, that they, that they, that they succeed to bring her uh, to the other camp so they could uh, stay all together. There was also some story with this, uh, with this transportation because the food rations in Weiden were so little. There was such unbelievable starvation. They were always hungry, always hungry. Even the boys which were uh, working by the farms, uh, they, they were hungry. They were given some food, but, but that was not enough. So when uh, my aunt was about to be sent for the family, reunited with the family, she was told, well, but here in the kitchen, you have food, you are not hungry because it's a kitchen. But she was saying, I would rather have one slice of bread per day, but to be with the family than to be here alone. So she, she, was, she was transferred, she was transferred and she stayed with, with all of them. The camp also made really um, important effect on what happened to the family after war. Afterwards, well, Poland was, uh, was liberated by the Red Army. And there was just this big question for my grandparents, which way to go, where to go? There were some um, advices, encouragement to leave 
uh, Europe and to go to um, Canada, to uh, South America. Uh, but that was easier for some people who were alone in the camp. And here there was a family of seven people. So, uh, and the children, and they had to go to school. They already started the school in DP camp. After the liberation, they were placed all in the DP camp. So they started Polish school there and they wanted to, to be home, to be with the family, with the relatives. Their home was already, uh, their house, th their house was uh, mm, uh, set ablaze by the Germans. Uh, and the land was uh, part of Soviet Union. So they had to look for another place to live. And they came back to Poland and they found a new place in Western Poland, which was before the war part of, of Germany. So there was the new settling uh, in, in, uh, of Polish communities. So they have to start from many, many aspects uh, again again. My dad was, was small, he was six when he was in the camp, but again, uh, he was with parents, with the families, there was someone taking care of him, but, that, but starvation, hunger, and the fear, the fear, the war, the aeroplanes, the bombing, uh, looking for the shelter to stay and wait for the quiet moment when the liberation came, uh, th that was part of their childhood, uh, uh, in fact. Thank you so much. That's an incredible story um, and a really well-framed uh, response. Um, we are sort of coming up on the end of our time, but I have one final question and then we'll take a few um, questions from the audience. We already have a couple in, in the chat. Um, so my final question is I wanted to sort of come back to this idea of, of unheard voices that we're, is the initial framing of this, um, this debate. Because, you know, one of the things I'm noticing is that we you know we've talked about really how unusual women and children's experiences could be, but in other cases, they're experiencing the same, you know, horrible treatment that men are experiencing and they're perceiving it differently because of this, um, because of who they are. And so I'm curious about sort of places you found where that was really a particular issue. You know, I was thinking about things like having your hair shaved, head shaved, like that's a humiliating experience for men. And for women, it's a differently humiliating experience, that sort of thing. Um, these ideas of um, women being the majority of victims, children being the majority of victims, how is that perceived between the two different groups? And so I'm just curious how this has become maybe a focus of your research and what is that is, has given you in, in, your, in your work? So either, if you'd like to start, maybe Dieter. Uh, yeah, it br brings us back to, uh, to to the accounts, to the interviews, uh, uh, to, to to the testimonies. Uh, what what I've tried to do and still trying to do in in my research on child forced labor is is to work with two very central, for me, very central categories for analysis. One is age, which has been, well, there, there the gap in research, let, 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 let's put it this way. Age, not even in, in, oral, in, in research based on oral history, play, plays a significant role. And the other category is, is gender, which, which is, well, well established, not as established as it should be, but much more better established than the category age. Uh, when I started my, my, my research, I, I went to a place uh, called Hagen, where in, in Germany, where uh, an open university is being placed and Alexander von Plato was there. And they made about five five to 600 interviews with former forced laborers. So I, I went there and I had a talk with, with, the, with the archivist and I explained what I was interested in and uh, saying, told her 
the archivist told her what my definition of a child is. And then she said, well, I, I have to check the computer, but I don't think we have many interviews conducted with former child forced laborers. And after a quarter of an hour, she came back and she said, oops, if you use that category, nearly half of our interviews have been conducted with former child forced laborers. What, what she didn't tell me was uh, that based on, on that oral history project, there were books and articles and nobody has given any consideration to the category eight. They made, let's put it a bit more drastic, they made conducted interviews with child forced laborers and wrote books about forced laborers as if they were all adults. And, and that's where I started. And if you take it seriously, you, you, you find the differences between testimonies and accounts of former children, child forced laborers and of adults. And many colleagues, even in oral history, they say, well, can you take a testimony in interview with a child? Can you take that seriously? Yes, you can, and you should. The perception and the remembrance of the memory of a former child forced labor might be a bit naive, but it's very exact and very precise. What you cannot expect is to have accurate dates. You cannot expect that somebody who was in a camp like Auschwitz for, for nine months that he or she can remember a week when something happened. But you shouldn't expect that from an interview. And you cannot expect uh, uh, that somebody remembers the color of a uniform precisely. That, that is not possible under these traumatic circumstances. That was relevant uh, at, at, at uh, trials and courts in Germany, but that's a different story. But what you can expect and what the uh, testimonies are, are, are really bring to your attention is the perception of trauma, the perception of, of shame to get undressed, in particular bringing in the category gender for, for, uh, for girls and, and young women, 17, when they had to undress in front of men, when they had to undress within the family, suddenly they saw they, they, their parents naked and they saw their brother naked or the other people, the neighbors naked. Uh, and, and this shame, which is engraved in the memory that comes over in, and they, they, they talk about it very vividly. Children talk about uh, violence. Children talk about sexualized violence and sexual violence being raped in all possible combinations, gender combinations. Girls being raped by uh, female guards, but also by men. Boys being uh, raped by female guards but also by, by couples. And, and, and that's a dimension I have never expected to find it in such a detail. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your question. That's exactly what I was interested okay. in, so thank you. Um, Teresa, anything to add? Well, again, the the testimonies, the interviews are again bringing us certain atmosphere of a different groups. And for example, I remember talking to uh, Polish uh, survivors, let's say members of resistance movement. So their, uh, their detention to camp was uh follow well first they were in prison so it was like kind of introduction and also well 
to be part of resistance movement again it's it is an act of uh, of uh, of some political let's say even at the age of of uh, of a teenager of political activity let's say and some awareness some element of of fighting in fact this is why their view of the camp and even the first contacts they were trying to establish, the people they were around, they worked like a group, like a support group, uh, seeing uh, or, or um, perceiving the other inmates as people they are to help. They are to support, they are to uh, make kind of union. And I remember one interview with a, a survivor. She was actually not in a, any political organization, her husband was. And because of the husband, they were both arrested. Very, very harsh interrogation in the police. She was in the early stage of pregnancy. She lost the baby. Her uh, husband was executed. And she was devastated when she was sent to the camp. And she said, if not the girls which were in the barrack, just some random people she never, never, never saw before, they were, they were the help group for her to the end of her staying. They made a group and they were supporting the other uh, all the time. Then uh, listening to the Jewish survivors, especially those who lost some uh, family members in the gas chambers. Uh, there, first there was this anger, this, uh, this like a, like a uh, process of accepting the fact that they survived, they are here, and the dearest family members, they were having such a close links and they loved, they, they are they are gone so they have to go through the process of accepting the situation and then their desire to survive was just to stick to all possible ways to all kind of work which was bringing them for a better situation in the camp and and the fight for life constant fight fight uh, fight for for life in terms of Roma survivors, this is for, for us, for researchers, a uh, really, really uh, a, a, a thing which we, which we actually cannot fill with, with some substantial amount of information. Why? Because so many of them died. That many of them died. There are not that many accounts. I remember some years ago, in 2014, the, uh, the Council in Katowice was organizing a very interesting conference because that was the anniversary of the liquidation of the um, Sinti and Roma camp in Birkenau. And there were a few historians, but there were also uh, people from the community, uh, from the families, of course, the uh, second, third generation. And uh, the two ladies, uh, they were from Silesia region, and they were having grandmother who survived uh, Birkenau. And they were saying, at home, we were not talking about it. That was not part of our conversation. That was not something what we could share, what we could ask, because that was so grieving that was so sad, that was so bad, that was a crime, that was something what according to, as they were explaining, the Roma uh, philosophy, attitude to life was to be left behind because it was so bad. So this is why they were, their, 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 their presentation was, was very interesting, how from the little sentences, from the little remarks from everyday life, they could learn that what the grandmother was going through in the, in the camp, like saving food, uh, cherishing the food, 
not throw, not, not, not left uh, over, uh, and, and, and no, no food for the, for the, for the, for the trash. Everything was so precious, and the house is to be clean and tidy because if not, there are the diseases coming, and there were that many diseases in the camp. So just this, this tiny, tiny uh, elements, and then there were also in the camp the survivors from the other countries who again were in resistance movement and for example the survivors remember um, the inmates female inmates from former yugoslavia they were from partisans movement and they were very they were remembered as a very strong woman women very um uh, self-assured, very uh, not accepting all the orders and the, the camp reality so easily, uh, trying to fight for their rights, uh, and good organizers or good organizers for, for the other uh, inmates. So the testimonies, as Dieter was saying, are a fabulous source of information and also to see the differences, to see the atmosphere, to see the different, to, 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 to see the consequences, what they were coming from, what was their background, the, 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 the family, the country, the circumstances they were arrested, what, what shaped them to survive the camp, and also what they took with them after, what they took to their life after the camp to be educator, to be person who is active in, 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 the, in the community, in, in social life. That's something I also could watch and, and, and I feel like being blessed to have the chance to, to see this wonderful women survivors. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have... Um couple of questions in the chat. So I'll start with Tahel's question um, and I'll just read. This question is about memory. When did the experiences of women and children begin to be discussed after the war? Was it in any way connected to the political situation in Poland? And if so, how? So maybe this is sort of related to this idea of different groups having different perceptions of, of events and then how they begin to discuss them. So. Well, looking at the literature, actually, that's something which was present right from the beginning, the very first publications we have, even before Auschwitz became a memorial. Uh, th this is very present. And then when the, the memorial with the archive, with the uh, research uh, historians started to work, uh, the situation of children were very important, significant uh, part of the history to be told. And my retired colleague, Helena Kubica, worked for many, many years uh, collecting the testimonies, um, uh, providing analysis of a different group, even uh, different transport, different events. She was she was she was wonderful historian. So even even one word or one name dropped uh, on her, and and she was having immediately wonderful story and everything in her head. So the the research was really uh, her life. Then another historian here, uh, Irena Strzelecka. Uh, sadly passed a few years ago, but also so dedicated person for the for the research. And as uh, they started the work here, that was part of, of their uh, research. But also those who were here before, who were uh, working on the on the on gathering the material, the archivists. Uh, they were paying great attention to, to this material. So uh, it took a, a quite a long time, but it's a wonderful collection. So I, um, I would encourage historians, history students, or uh, people interested to, um, to have, 
uh, have a contact with the collections to to read uh, to analyze uh, there are many many um, um, uh, problems let's say um, many situation many stories waiting to be told and to be known for wider uh, wider uh, opinion wider public so it's it's the work the research is not done and we are talking only about the testimonies but we have here material we have here uh, documents in german so they insist a good uh, knowledge of of the language but they are again waiting to be presented the story which is in this material is also to be told. So uh, that's that's something uh, what is waiting for the for the next to come to work here. Peter, maybe you have some yeah. comments on yeah. No, you you you've presented that in in a wonderful way, um, but. I think we, we we should be honest. It it's not mainstream history what we are doing. It is not. And one of the big questions for 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 historians is, on the basis of of personal accounts, how can we generalize? Is it is it possible to generalize? If if you go into the niche of of oral history, people will tell you, no, don't do that. Every single story counts, but mainstream historians say, no, we, we, we have to, that's our daily bread and butter, we have to generalize. And in this part of our work, as you rightly said, we are just at the beginning. If you have in mind that for survivors of the Shoah, we have more than 100,000 interviews and accounts and we have good finding aids but not perfect finding aids indexes uh, to, to, to make use of 100 more than 100,000 personal accounts and what we have done so far is with with all respect uh, in particular you, you mentioned Helena which was a, which is a, a great historian I, I met her uh, in, in Auschwitz ages ago, uh, but with all respect, we are just scratching the surface. And, and, and there, there, is, there, there is a lot, lot of work to do, which will keep historians busy for decades to come. And, and what we write today uh, will be criticized, uh, criticized tomorrow, but, but again, that, 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 that's quite normal, uh, but but we have to face that we are working in a niche, in a fascinating niche for 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 historian and a very sad niche. But but it is a niche only, but that will change. Thank you. Um, so I have one question for each of you, and then we mm -hmm. have a sort of a final going forward questions. So for Dieter, and so I'll ask you both the questions and then maybe go back to Dieter to answer. So my question for you, and I think this is related to my own subject of interest, you said that you hate the word transport. And I was thinking about that because we have this concept etap in, in the Soviet prison system, which is this sort of general category of the transport and how this is such a, a unique category that is examined and deserves to be examined further. So I'm curious if that's what you're referring to or if you have other things that you'd like to talk about with that, um, anything else to say on that. But but let me ask my question to Teresa. This is from Alina who asked what happened to pregnant women in the camps. You mentioned it a little bit about what happened to the children, what happened to the, to the women as well. Um, so those are our two questions. Um, Dieter, if you, if you have anything to say about transport. Well, no, we, we, we had a, a a discussion some 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 days ago, Alina, Teresa, and 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 I, and uh, I only came came to that because Teresa told us that that she uh, is using for her research uh, the German terminology, 
and and then I said, oh no, I'm I'm uh, trying to 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 distance myself as far as possible from the German terminology, uh, the 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 ugly word transport. Somebody goes on transport. Oh, I get goose pickles from that. They have been deported. So what what, what is Arbeitseinsatz? I mean, it, you cannot even translate it. It's it's a camouflage of of uh, of, of forced labor and, and nothing else. Uh, Teresa would like to say, I, I guess, slave labor, but, but uh, we don't have to 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 uh, go in, into a discussion of that. And and these all these German contemporary terms used to camouflage crime. And, and we, we, we do not have to, to use them again and again and, and go into the, let's call it semantic trap of these German and other actors of, of, of the time. So we, we, we have other uh, uh, words and other terminology who can precise, who can describe in a very precise way what we mean and 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 I personally I I I have my black list of most hated words. It it stopped what is very popular in the Anglo speaking uh, English speaking uh, world is the word Nazi. And in my past I, I used the word as well. And and one of the conferences I'm, I'm co-organizing for for more than twenty years now, we we have the word Nazi in uh, in in the conference title. So I have to blame myself. But in 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 my books and articles, uh, I at the end before I send it off to the publisher, I, I do my word search and eliminate all Nazi. I I, I talk about national socialism. Or I talk about German, more and more about Germans, not about Nazis. I mean, Poland was, was not occupied by Nazis, but was occupied by German troops. Let, let's face it. Uh, so so I, 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 I have my, my blacklist of, of hated words and because I think we can use a different language, which is precise and which distance us as historians. From, from from the past. But Thank maybe you. I've traumatized myself. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's really helpful to, to think about. It's not something that I even considered that transport could be sort of a euphemistic way of describing mm. deportation, mass movement of peoples, which is always a violent process. So um, yeah, Teresa, you could anything you want to add about transport or Pregnant women in Auschwitz, either way. If may I both. <laughs> so very, very briefly about the language. I remember some years ago, I met a professor. He was the language professor, languages. Uh, and he was working on the vocabulary. She was, he was approaching actually the English speaking word, but also uh, uh, literature, uh, German literature, and uh, analyzing some words and just this, this dilemmas, just this, this, this uh, tiny elements which are to, to uh, describe the concentration camps and, uh, and Holocaust and and slave labor and many other. So again, as we were talking a moment ago about, about scientists, researchers, so that actually all disciplines are having uh, some, some work to do as a, as a not the main street, but still quite fascinating. The other question, well, the first question, pregnant women. Uh, last year here in Poland, we were having two books published dedicated to um, Stanisława Leszczyńska, uh, the inmate of Auschwitz midwife, midwife who was sent here for the maternity ward in uh, Birkenau. 
Uh, one was published actually by her family members, which are what is extremely precious because we, we see the whole family has history, her path to the camp and what happened to her after. And again, uh, children born in the camp, pregnant women uh, became, uh, became subject of, of debate. So the, the story is, is, is full of tragedies. So as we know, in terms of Jewish mothers, they were in the first year sent immediately for the gas chamber when they were found of being pregnant. Later on, the regulation was changed and they were allowed to have the baby in the camp because they, the women were needed as, as slave labor, as hands for work, and the babies were murdered, immediately were murdered. So when Stanisława Leszczyńska was describing uh, the, um, the, the, the births and the mothers, in, in each case, the, the final situation was that the, the German nurses came and, and the baby was killed. The baby was, was killed in a bucket, bucket of water. So that, that was the drama. Then the Polish mothers, the non-Jewish mothers, they were allowed to have the baby in the camp and they were born. Stanisława Leszczyńska was saying that all the births she was at, they were happy and all the children were born healthy and beautiful. But in the camp where the epidemics were spreading in enormous scale, no food, catastrophal sanitary conditions, their chances to survive were actually no chance. So Stanisława Leszczyńska is describing how the babies were changing day after day as they were not given food, the mothers were not able to, to nurse the babies. So the, their skin became so thin like paper and then they stopped crying because they were dying. So something something really traumatic. In Roma camp, as that was family camp, there were also children born. They were with the mothers, but the same situation, starvation, uh, diseases. And then when the Roma camp was liquidated on the 2nd of August, 44, all the children who survived were also murdered. So there is a, a number of people who were born in the camp and they survived, but they were born, uh, mo most of them, in the final weeks of the camp existence. There are also some exceptions, uh, exceptional situation like Josef Gomez, uh, a Jewish boy born by the Jewish mother who was registered with the fake Aryan Polish documentation and and he survived he was liberated here but that that's absolutely unique story but most of the children they were murdered in the camp yeah just um <laughs> let me just thank you all so much i really appreciate you talking to us today we have one final question and then we'll um we'll be be through with our discussion um and so this question is i'm finding it in the chat um sort of takes us from what we're talking about in the past to today's situation um because the title of our debate is on her, this question is from olga um one of our our hosts here at um Poletsky. she says the debate title is unheard voices today all of us can witness the russian ukrainian war there are already a lot of victims a lot of refugees many of whom are women and children how could we make their voices better heard around the world? Teresa, perhaps? Wow. Oh, wow, that's something from everyday meetings here on the street. Just, just yesterday, Sunday, the Easter, uh, Ukrainian Easter, and around me, just we have the refugees around everywhere. And the first day when they were coming, they were uh, scared, they were shocked. 
But now as the weeks are passing and they are settled a little bit more, I noticed that they started talking. And just here in my neighborhood, I have uh, three ladies from Odessa. I got a few ladies from Kiev as well. And they, they have everything what they need so far for them, for the children, smaller children, teenager children, but also what they need so much is a conversation, is the way to talk and to be asked the question, how are they doing? How the families are doing? So every time I have an occasion to chat to them, uh, I see how, how, how the life is changing. And they are, of course, talk, chatting, talking so much between themselves, but I think it helps when someone else is also from the neighborhood wants to know how they are doing. It's, yeah, it's absolutely every day on the street. I, in my morning bus to work, I have, I commute with a girl, she's a teenage student of a high school. And the first day she was a little bit in trouble, so I need to help on the bus. This is why I know that she's Ukrainian. Then on my bus back to, to back home, again, they are, uh, they are mothers with children. Sometimes they are with some bags, sometimes suitcases. They are commuting between the towns. Or, or mothers with, with children uh, searching for a safe place on the bus and, and going to do some shopping or many other things. So this is our life now. They are all around us and uh, we are trying everything possible to, to help them, to take care of them and to, to listen to them because they, they want to talk, they need to talk. No, you did. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> turning to you. Yeah, I think we we uh, we we can learn from the past. The the first interviews with survivors of the Shoah have been conducted in 1944 in Lublin, and. It, it, since then, uh, we, in different intervals, uh, interviews and accounts have, have been collected. And I think we, we should do exactly that the same, get establish a research project, interview project, get uh, ethical approval from, from your institutions and record the experience of, uh, of, of these refugees. Uh, I think that that's something we can do, and that has been done from 1944 onwards. And it's only that uh, which the, these accounts enable us to do our research. And, and if there is something like learning from the past, it's it's based on on on, on these accounts. So don't don't miss it. Get your tape recorders out of the storage room, do the interviews, but with ethical approval, of course, not otherwise you can do more harm than good. Feels like a very pointed thing that I myself should be doing on my preparing for my own trip to Poland in the near future. Yeah. So I appreciate it on a personal level. Um, and of course, thank you uh, to both uh, Dieter and Teresa for your wonderful comments today. And uh, I believe we'll end it right there, um, but uh, I hope everyone has a nice evening. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you.